myself included because I'm usually talking. And so, <laughs> all right. So let's see what we got for this afternoon. Still working with sellers. We're spending quite a amount of time working with sellers. Um, And what we were talking about was measuring. Are you guys there? Do I have you guys? Okay. okay. All right. I flickered on my end. I've learned to ask. I know one time I stood here and talked to myself for like 20 minutes and everybody was frozen. I wasn't really paying attention. So <laughs> if I see a flicker or something funny, I'm just going to verify you guys are there. So we left talking about measuring square footage for land, right? So we're gonna take the front foot times the depth of the lot. Um, when is a square or rectangle? Again, if it's one of those funky shapes, we may not be able to measure, we may not be qualified for that. Again, hopefully the seller has and is willing to share their survey. So now we need to talk about measuring um, a home, a property and measuring rooms, dimensions. When measuring square footage, first off, did you guys know square footage is not required by the North Carolina Real Estate Commission? Commission doesn't require us. The commission says it's not a material fact. We don't have to disclose it. Guess what though? For example, the Triad MLS has the total heated square foot as a required field. So while the commission doesn't require it, your MLS may. Um, not a uh, MLS is due. I, I know we did this class and I had a lady up in the mountains and she said, we never report square footage. I said, wow, that was news to me. So if your MLS requires it, then you have to have it to put it in. The Real Estate Commission says, while we don't require, while we don't consider it a material fact, if you disclose it, the information has to be accurate. Everybody good with that? Not required, but the commission may be required by your local MLS. The commission does say if you report it though, we're responsible for it. We're getting ready to look at what I refer to as our measuring Bible. Um, has anybody measured a house yet? Has anybody had that opportunity? Chastity has, Donna, okay, good. When you're learning how to measure, hopefully you're out your first couple of times with an experienced agent, somebody that can help you, help guide you. Um, eventually you're gonna be on your own. Remember if you have any questions or anything, you have this measuring book. Um, as of before, we're expected to measure ourselves or hire somebody with more experience to do it for us. So in other words, you can't hire the, 14 year old on the block to go measure the house, right? You have to hire someone more experienced, either an agent with more experience or an appraiser. I know some agents that won't measure. They are that unsecure in their uh, math and their measuring. They choose to pay somebody to go out and measure for every single listing. You guys have choices. It comes down to time versus money, right? Does it, isn't that what a lot of our choices come down to? Time versus money. I promise you the first time you measure a house, it's going to take you forever. Did you feel like you were ever gonna leave? <laughs> you might as well move in, bring your toothbrush, right? But once you do it a few times, I promise you it does get a little bit easier. So practice, practice, practice. We'll look at this booklet in just a second. I got it Learn Test Pass for you so you can download it if you want. I see Chassie's got her version in her hand. So she's got the, the actual. Um, so we'll look at this in just a second, but just talk about a few things that we get from the booklet. First off, we need to understand what is considered living area criteria, also known as heated living area, also known as heated square foot. 
In order for me to count it as heated square foot, we have to have these three things, must. The space has to be heated by a permanently installed heater, heating system. You can't put a space heater in a room and say it's heated. It's gotta be a permanently installed heating system. And you guys, please note that says heat, that does not say AC. AC is not required, heat is. The space has to be finished. By finished, we mean finished construction of walls, floors, and ceilings. Does anybody know the required ceiling height? The required ceiling height, yep, look at your fingers up. Yep, seven feet. The ceiling has to be at least seven feet to count. Unless you're in like an attic with a bonus room that has slope ceilings, um, then that can be five feet. Your slope ceilings can be five feet. And then the third criteria is it has to be directly accessible from other living area. So in other words, you need to be able to walk from finished heated room to finished heated room. If, for example, let's say there's a finished room over the garage. And in order to access the stairs for the finished room over the garage, you have to walk through the unfinished, unheated garage. You with me? You walk through the garage to get to the stairs. I cannot count the room over the garage in my total heated square foot. Now I can still advertise it, yes. I can say there's a finished room over the garage at 500 square feet or whatever it is. I can still advertise, and I would if I were you, because goodness, isn't that a nice bonus? But the point here is you can't um, go through an unheated, unfinished space and be have that count. Does that make sense to you guys? Now, what if the stairs are inside? Maybe you go through the laundry room to get the stairs and you don't have to go through the garage. Now I can count, as long as the laundry room is heated and finished, now I can count that in my total heated square foot. So I think the general rule of thumb, if you walk from room to room, if you ever get cold or you ever see studs or unfinished space, then we cannot count that. Julian, your experience, how would you um, price that on a CMA um, with the staircase in the garage? Yeah, that could get interesting, couldn't it? Because it's still good space, but I don't have that square footage. So I think an appraiser absolutely would see value in that. Um, of course, I would look at comps and see if there's something similar nearby, kind of gauge how they looked at that. Um, but that might be one of those. That could get tricky. And that's the thing with measuring is every single house is different. You're not just measuring, but putting value on something, right? Putting probable sales price on something. So I absolutely would consider it. I would give it value. I would just keep in mind that it may not count as much as if it were included in the heated square footage. Kind of like your finished basement, right? Below grade space. And we're going to talk about below grade space. Appraisers don't consider below grade space have as much value as above grade space. It still has value, just not as much. So let's see, Abigail, if I could get you to rename yourself, looks like you reverted back at lunch. I know. <laughs> when we measure, we typically start outside. So you outside, go outside and you measure from corner to corner. Again, not all homes are perfect squares and rectangles. We're gonna look at some examples in just a second. But you wanna measure outside. If you have exterior that can't be measured from the outside, now you go inside and you measure exterior walls. Everybody good in the difference in an exterior wall and an interior wall. With an exterior wall on the other side is the outside. In an interior wall, the other side is still inside. So you would go inside. Let's say it's a two story. Let me try to draw for a second. Let's say you have a two story home and the first floor is here and maybe the second floor is a little bit bigger than the first floor. 
I can go around and measure the first floor, right? I can't safely measure the second floor outside. So I would measure the first floor outside and then I would go inside, measure the interior, excuse me, the exterior walls and add six inches. If you can't measure on the outside, maybe it's a below grade and the basement is, is underground. You go inside and measure the exterior walls and you add six inches and that accounts for the average thickness of the wall. The exception to that, room, to that rule are condos. Condos, you measure exterior walls and don't add six inches. Condo owners own interior only, paint to paint. So you would measure that exterior wall and not add six inches. Uh, we mentioned earlier the difference in above grade and below grade. Below grade is considered anything where the outside touches dirt. So if you have any area that touches earth, that's considered below grade. So here, and I have a nice basement down here, do I have a nice finished basement? Absolutely, we could count this in our total heat of square foot because I got these stairs that make it directly accessible. To me, it looks finished and I'm gonna assume that it's heated. So I can count this in my total heat of square foot. While we're not expected to put value on below grade, we need to understand and we need our sellers to understand that the appraiser isn't gonna put as much value to below grade as what they are above grade. So John, that may be the thing too. You know, we could put it in there as value um, if you have the, the finished room over the garage, um, but just understanding that the appraiser may put a different opinion on that. And, and, and remember, value is the difference in whether or not you're appraisal or not, right? Unless you're an appraiser, I can't give value. We give probable sales price. And that's the difference in me and an appraiser. Another reason why I report in a range, right? I don't give an exact amount, but that range may a lot from the appraiser's adjustments in below grade or like that finish room over the garage that you know, doesn't have. So that kind of gives me some wiggle room there. So again, when you measure, you want to start outside and you go from corner to corner. So I would start here. Let me get another color so we can see. Let me start here and I would measure from here to here and then here to here. I could go past the deck, measure here to here. You guys see what we're doing? We're going outside. When you're measuring outside, you're probably going to want like a cloth measuring tape. Um, so you can go from point to point. So you can go from corner to corner. Usually cloth measuring tapes go up to 100 feet. So that could get you started. If you're measuring alone, take like a really, really big screwdriver or something that you kind of jam in the ground and have something to hold on to while you're trying to measure. If you take somebody with you, if you take, if it's your listing, you're measuring for your listing and you take somebody with you, you need to let them hold the dummy end. So they're just standing there holding it, right? You're the one that's actually looking at the measurements because it's your responsibility. I got a question. Sure. So the garage, we it's, I'm assuming it's not heated. Correct. So we do measure, but report it as. Nope, we're not oh. done yet. So we oh. started, we measured outside, right? Okay. And now that we've measured inside, now we go inside and we measure the garage and we deduct the space, right? Well, not even that, Never mind that. Now we go in and measure the garage and we deduct that space and we measure this part of the porch and we deduct that space. Okay. So we start outside, measure everything in the exterior and then go inside and deduct what doesn't count. Gotcha.
okay? Once we do that, we get our total heated square foot for the living area. That's the number we put in Triad MLS. That's the minimum you have to do for Triad MLS. Room dimensions in Triad MLS aren't, um, aren't required. Again, I don't know about other MLSs, so just check with your board, check with your BIC. But for Triad MLS, we at least need to do that. Again, you guys, I cannot rely on um, tax records. Tax records, you know, they may be, they may do a better job in getting the lot dimensions right, the acres right, um, but they usually do a poor job in getting the property square footage correct. Um, we can't rely on builders' blueprints if your seller happens to have those. And do not rely on a previous MLS listing that some other agents work. We cannot take somebody else's work without their permission. When we look at our booklet in just a second, we're gonna see a booklet gives us a nice conversion tab. When we're measuring feet and inches, we gotta speak the same language, right? So for example, if you have uh, seven feet, I don't know, five inches. In order for me to calculate that, I gotta convert the inches to feet. And we'll look at just a second on how we can do that. And we don't even have to know how to do that. The guide tells us how to do it. It gives us a nice little chart. So we'll see that in just a second. But if you're reporting the room dimensions of each room, let's say you wanna report the um, room dimensions of the kitchen and you wanna report the room dimensions of the dining room and the bedrooms and the living room, and the breakfast room. Instead of saying front foot by depth, now that we're inside, we can do the room dimensions as length of times width. So we could say here are the dimensions of the kitchen. If you wanna take it a step further and say the kitchen is this many square feet, but usually what buyers look for are room dimensions. And I do think that buyers look for these. I think sellers like to see them because they know that buyers might be looking. Remember what we said earlier, if it's important to my buyer, then it's important to me. So I had a buyer a couple years ago and she said, my dining room table seats 10 people, four on each side, two at the, one at the head, one at the foot. She said, I leave a service set out for 10 at all times, plus my credenza, plus my china cabinet. I need a dining room big enough to hold my dining room furniture. Do I not have a material fact on my hand to find her dining room big enough to hold her furniture? By looking at these room dimensions in MLS, this saved us some time. There were some property that we didn't even, got. that's a huge dining room, you guys. I mean, she was not taking the leaf out. She left her table service set for 10 <laughs> at all times. Um, so that was something I had to make sure. I said, well, you know, we can go look at this, but the dining room dimensions are this by this. Is your furniture going to fit? Obviously, if the dimensions weren't available to us, then we may have to go out and turn around and walk back, back right out, you know, as soon as we walk in and see that it's not big enough. So I think sometimes those dimensions are helpful. Um, I think that this is something that in this crazy market that we're in, I think we've kind of all gotten a little bad on putting room dimensions in because we know it's going to sell tomorrow anyway, right? So what's the big deal? Um, this might be something that comes back later and becomes more important when that pendulum swings back and we're back in a, um, buy, a buyer's market. This is going to be your homework assignment that we'll look at in just a second. I'm going to have a floor plan for you guys. And I'm gonna ask you guys this week to study the floor plan and tell me how many square feet are in the kitchen, how many square feet are in the, the dining room, the bedrooms, um, kind of look at the floor plan and get an idea of overall square footage of the property. So please make sure you have this formula jotted down or in your mind uh, so we can do the, the homework this week. This discussion, um, so when you're measuring outside, again, you're getting feet and inches. So I'm measuring from here to here, I'm gonna get so many feet and so many inches, right? So 
once I measure, once I get my dimensions, then I have a better idea, right? Pretty much I got to add them up, right? So if I get that, then I can go back through and like you said, then deduct, you know, the things that don't count, the things that don't. So you might be doing several, get graph paper. When you go to measure, get graph paper. I think that absolutely helps. By the way, if you measure your own, y'all keep your graph paper, keep your sketches, show your work. That's part of your documentation because if it ever goes down, the commission's gonna wanna see that you did it. If you hired somebody, hopefully they're providing their sketches, at least the figures. If not, you have their name so you know if it goes down, but even if you hire somebody, you're still responsible. Yet another good reason to hire somebody with experience and not the 16 year old down the street, right? Even though they did it, you're still responsible if it's, if it's your listing. Yeah, yep, yep. And you may have to, you know, from like here to here and then here to here, you know, you may have to chop it up a little bit. All we know how to measure are squares and rectangles, right? Length times width is square and rectangles. So if you if the room isn't a, or if the house is in a square or a rectangle, you may have to break it down and make it make it, and that's where graph paper comes into handy. Um, I showed a house once that was a an octagon. It had eight sides, and and the buyer was a good friend of mine, and she said, "My gosh, Julie, how would you how would you measure this?" And I said, "Well, I wouldn't. I don't know how to measure this shape. So if I were taking this listing, I would think that would be one that would be worth." you know, having an appraiser come in and do somebody with more experience. Well, wouldn't you just measure the perimeter and then divide by four? Now you sure. got length and width. I have width. no idea. <laughs> oh, I know how okay. to measure squares and rectangles. So if you know more than me, bravo, just, just be careful. <laughs> That's my preference to hire an appraiser to measure that house because that just went beyond my, my scope. <laughs> Again, this discussion that we've had is about residential property. So before we go look at our booklet, let's know that there's a difference in measuring for commercial and residential. The booklet that you have that we're getting ready to look at is for measuring residential square footage. It doesn't work for commercial buildings. Um, if you're gonna attempt to measure commercial buildings, you need some experience. Um, and this is where commercial takes a lot sometimes a lot more experience finessing than residential. Um, you need to make sure there's various things to think about with commercial because commercial has unfinished space. I mean, think about like a large office building that's unfinished waiting for the tenant to come in and finish it, right? So there's unfinished space, finished space, there's divided space. So there's multiple different methods for measuring commercial could be multiple different methods for measuring the same commercial building. So just know if you ever get into commercial, you got a lot more training um, as with anything. So if we look and learn test pass, it's under our welcome section and we call it the little yellow book. Um, you may have a copy in your hands if you guys don't have a copy, you're welcome to come in and learn test pass and download it. You can download anything from here. So if you don't have a copy yet, you can come in and grab this and download it for your records. By the way, are we all in learn test pass? I meant to ask that this morning. Are we all in head bobs? Most of us, if not, please do so. So you can be prepared for next weekend. So our little booklet starts with an introduction. Um, what are the three most important things about real estate? Location, location, location. And we have information on here that refer that tells us about the living area criteria. So it reinforces what we just said. It has to be heated by a permanently installed. Um, a portable heater is not permanently installed. A fireplace isn't considered a permanently installed. It's got to be an HVAC system, forced air, solar, et cetera. Uh, it's got to be finished with walls, floors, and ceilings. 
um, to generally accepted practices, building practices, ceiling height of at least seven feet, except under beams. And it's gotta be directly accessible, again, through a door or by a heated hallway or stairway. So if you're gonna, if you're wondering if you should count it as total heated square footage, you gotta have all three of those things. All three of those things are required. Um, this little box over here talks about below grade and above grade. So it helps us better understand, again, below grade is anything that touches earth. If any side of it touches earth, it's below grade. So if the home's built on a slope, it might be the back side touches earth, but the front side doesn't. But because one side touches earth, the whole thing is considered below grade. So it has to be dug down, dug in to get it. And then this book, and I think this is good. The book goes on to talk about um, measuring various things. So it talks about how attics, I think the big thing with a finished attic, it's not uncommon to see that slope ceiling. Uh, basements or below grade space, uh, if it has a bay window. I think a good rule of thumb, if you can walk on it, and it meets those three things and you can count it. So the bay window might be the difference in, can you walk on it? Or is it one of those things that has like a bench that's meant for you to sit on? If you can count that bay window or not will depend. Here's your bonus room or your finished room over the garage. Breezeways, they have to be enclosed to count. If they're open, you may go from the home through the breezeway to a bonus room. If that bonus room is finished, I can't count it as total heated square foot because I had to go through the breezeway. I had to go through the unfinished space. What if the breezeway is enclosed though? Uh, chimney, chimney bases, closets, dormers, are those little windows on the roofs? Um, furnace rooms. Typically furnace rooms and closets, we're just gonna include as living area criteria. So remember we're starting on the outside when possible, but we don't need to worry about um, taking those out. Hallways are gonna count, laundry rooms, offices, if they meet the criteria. Stairs can get a little tricky. Generally stairs, um, if they meet the criteria, then stairs can generally count twice. Because with stairs, if you were to put stairs on, let's see, this is our second floor. This is our first floor. And then we have stairs. Let's pretend for just a second that we put these stairs on this little hinge. If we were to pull the stairs up, you'd be walking on them on the second floor, right? And in addition, you'd be walking on underneath them on the first floor. So most of the time, unless it's like an open four year or something, stairs can generally count twice the second floor and the first floor. A storage room, other area, helpful hints. This is a really good book. Um, it talks about your exterior measurements, getting your cloth measuring tape so you can measure the outside. The other thing I wanna point out to you guys that I make sure that we see, here's our conversion. So we don't use our conversions, we don't use a 12th, um, 12 inches, we use tenths of a foot. So if, what was the example I gave a few minutes ago? If your kitchen is seven feet by eight inches, in order for me, let's see your kitchen, seven feet by eight inches, or seven feet, eight inches by eight feet, three inches. In order for me to determine, these are the kitchen dimensions. And in order for me to determine the square foot of the kitchen, I need to convert my inches to feet. And this little guy tells us how we can do it. So if I have eight inches, my kitchen is actually 7.7 .7 feet. You guys see what I did that? I took my eight inches and I converted it to 0.7 feet. So we don't even have to know this math. This book helps us with this. I don't know why they don't do 12s. I know that's 
took me a minute to, to I'm still, but they tell us to do tenths. Um, same thing if it's eight by three, it tells us that three inches converts to 0.25. So we can say eight by, right? So now I've converted inches to feet. Now I have a number I can work with. Length times width tells me 7.7 .7 times 8.25 gives me 63.53 square feet for this kitchen. Yeah, I, you know, I learned how to measure from a general contractor and I argued with him. I'm like, there are 12 inches in a feet. He was like, I hear you, but for some reason it's different when we measure, I don't know why. So remember earlier, I referred to this as your measuring Bible. <laughs> so use it as the, as the true word when it comes to, to measurement. Julie, do you have the hundred foot measuring tape real? Um, I don't, but he does. Okay, yeah. so that's what he measures with like, yeah. I see, okay. They offer 200, but we don't need that, right? You, probably just a hundred. I mean, they say a hundred is enough. You could have a really big house where you may need more. So if you don't, if you if it's more than a hundred, you just have to mark where you stopped. Yeah, you know okay. what I'm saying. So then you can go and start back there. That's a pretty big house, though. If you need more than a hundred, well, that's what we're going for. <laughs> the big house, <laughs> the really no. big house. No. Okay. <laughs> So again, your homework assignment, you guys are going to want to use this conversion guide. You guys are going to want to be able to use this. And, and, and it's, you know, it's not a difficult assignment, but, but you, again, you're just going to be asked to tell me the, the dimensions of the kitchen, the, the square footage, I should say, of the kitchen, the dining room. All you got to do is convert those inches to feet. Julie, um, <clears throat> if <clears throat> I, all my life, I've always done whatever inches over 12 to get the decimal. If we do it that way, is it going to be wrong? There's another method of, me of measuring. And um, they use that method. And it's kind of interesting that you said that because I think, hang on just one second. I just recently saw this, like, Like just the other day. Yeah. So if you guys got the April bulletin and they don't have it on the commission's website yet. So you guys check your email. But if you got the April bulletin, sure enough, they got an article right here about residential square footage guides versus this ANSI. So if you guys saw this, if not, again, if you're not getting these emails, check your, check your spam. And eventually they'll have this on the homepage. So right now they don't have it up yet, right? They only go through March, but eventually they will have this on the homepage. So John, this might be, um, and we're pretty much told here we could use one or the other. So just make sure if you're using the residential square footage guidelines, you're going by that. If you're using this American National Standards Institute or ANSI, do one or the other. Take one and yeah, take one. I just think it's funny because like that on that chart, eight inches is not really 0.7 of a foot. You know, right. eight inches is 0 0.666 of a foot. And that's why they give us, they, they tell us rep, it's a, it, measurements are inches a tenth of a foot. I don't know where they got that, John. I, I don't. I don't. Like, I've stood there and argued with a general contractor. You know how far it got me, but <laughs> I tried. <laughs> but that's how they do it. This is just a homework assignment, right? Yeah. And on the test, if there is an answer, it's going to be not close enough to matter? Um, you will not see this math on your test. The only math you'll see this is in the homework assignment where you can use the residential. You can, And, and I'm telling you guys to use this. I'm not grading you for right or wrong. I'm just making sure that you did it. Because the commission requires it, by the way. This isn't Julie requiring it. The Real Estate Commission refers this as a mandatory homework assignment. And we're doing more than 30 hours. 
I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so let me again. This is a learn test pass. This little booklet, and there's more. Oh, there's more stuff in here. The other thing I like about this booklet, um, and again, this is all good stuff. But then it gives you like different examples. So it gives you a floor plan, a one story with a basement and a carport. It kind of gives you some different parts about the property. And then it gives you the dimensions. So you can kind of study the different floor plans and then how those dimensions, that subtotal is gonna look. Um, here's a two story with an open foyer and a finished attic. They go through a two story with a bonus room. So it's a good, it's a good guide. It's a good worksheet uh, to help you help you learn how to measure. So again, learn to ask pass in the welcome section, little yellow book. And that gives you the conversion chart that you guys need to do to do your homework. And that conversion chart is on page five of the booklet. So let me stop sharing just for one second. Let me get you guys some stuff. First off, I'm getting ready to put a link in the chat. And this is a link to a YouTube video. Uh, you, you know, if you guys want to grab it, this isn't required. This is simply here for your information. So here's the link. You guys see it? You guys get it? Okay. Where this is taking you is to a YouTube video. I ask that you please not watch it now. But the Winston-Salem Board of Realtors and Piedmont Federal National Bank did this five part series on home measurement fundamentals. And I think they did a good job. Uh, the first video, which is the link that I gave you guys is a general overall view of measurement. And then they have, and you can find them in your YouTube chat. Uh, for example, episode two is about measuring, I think a ranch. Episode three is measuring a two story. Episode four is measuring a, a, like a one and a half story. You know what I'm saying? So the first episode is the general overall picture. And then they give you specifics. Uh, one of them is maybe a ranch with a basement, something like that. So by me giving you guys the video, you can still access the, um, the episodes and find that channel. Again, that's not required. If you want to watch it, watch it. If you don't, don't. But I think they did a good job. I think it's helpful. And I think it does a, a nice job of kind of summing up some of the things that we've been talking about. So that's that. And the other thing... I'm gonna put in here for you is your homework assignment. So I'll put it in here and then we'll look at it. Should be popping up there it goes so let's take a look at this and tell you what i what we need to do this is just a very generic floor plan uh nothing special about it And what we're looking at with this floor plan, you got now, now we can't get the total heated square footage of this because I know that the total length is 56 feet. I know that the total width is 31 feet. You guys see these numbers on the side. What I don't know is how much of the garage. So while we know we would start outside and measure it, we would want to come inside and deduct. Well, I guess we can do that. I guess we can. We can get, you know, measure the length and width of the property and then come inside and get the square feet for the garage and deduct that. So anything other than the garage is going to be total heated square foot. 
So what I would like you guys to do uh, for your homework is to study this. And I want to know the dimensions of the rooms, the home and the rooms, the garage, kitchen, living room, bedroom, da, da, da. So those dimensions, obviously you can't give me bathroom. You can't give me closet, right? Only the dimensions that you have. So I'm looking for the total heated square footage and I'm looking for the dimensions of the rooms. And everybody got that in the chat. Yes, and downloaded it. It didn't come through. Donna, yours never works. Why not? <laughs> um, I'll shoot you an email after class. Let me make a note. I took a picture of it. Are you I good? Can, okay, okay. I, I took a picture and uh, I can figure it. But you're wanting total square footage. Total square I want total footage. square foot, and then I want square feet of the different rooms, the kitchen, living room, dining room, and the three bedroom. Two homework assignments. This is one of them. Questions on this one. We'll talk about this next weekend. You guys can email this to me. Again, I'm not looking for right, wrong. I just need, the commission just wants to know that you did it. They just want to know that you tried. So you can shoot me an email with your findings this week. Julie, the real estate instructor at gmail.com. Questions on that? Questions on measuring? I had a student once, it was heartbreaking. But it's the truth, it's the world we live in. Um, bottom line, the very first house that she measured, her broker in charge gave her wrong advice, gave her wrong information, not bad advice, wrong information. The property went under contract, the appraiser came back with a totally different number, not even close. The sellers were livid at her. She said, that's it. I'm never measuring another house again. I will pay somebody to measure for the rest of my career. She said, I messed this first one up so badly. And I thought, honey, you didn't mess it up. It was your bit that messed it up. But it was messed up so badly. She almost had an incident. She almost had a disciplinary action. She almost, and it, she said, that's it. I'm done. My measuring days are over. So now every single listing that she has for the rest of her career, she's paying somebody to do it. Guys, we all make mistakes. We learn from those mistakes. I'm sorry. If you're planning on doing this and being a top producer, you're going to be having lots of listings and you're going to be paying out lots of money. Sorry, Maria. I'm sorry. Who did you say? Because I mean, I probably don't want to like measure or anything like that because I'm afraid of that being wrong. Who would be the best source for us to get like a certified or, you know, like a, a good measuring guy or something like that? Um, your big may know somebody, your firm, but like I said, an appraiser, any local appraiser will do it for a fee. Um, they usually charge is going to be on the size of the house, right? Based on how large the house is. Is it two stories, right? So they probably start with a flat fee going up from there. Um, seasoned experienced agents in your office. You can also rely on them to help too. So, you know, if somebody's been doing it for, you know, 20, 30 years and you feel confident in their skills, um, but I would check with your BIC and see who they might recommend. So you tell me you're already nervous to do it too before you, <laughs> you'd rather pay? <laughs> uh, I just affiliated with the firm and I'm just like going through the process. So I'm just like kind of nervous about just making mistakes, especially because, you know, I'm fairly new and I just don't, you know, just jumping in. It's just kind of. I'd rather have it done professionally and, you know, make sure that it gets done right than go out there myself and mess it up. Absolutely. And, you know, as a newbie, you might be going out with agents when they measure. So you might get to go out and hold the dummy end a couple of times, you know, and then the first couple of times you have your own listing, um, take somebody with you. So, I mean, we're not really throwing you in the deep end. We're kind of throwing you in the three foot end, you know, not the shallow end either. We're kind of throwing you in the middle of the pool here. Um, but at least if you, you know, have um, agents in your office, if your BIC, you know, has some experience, at least somebody can be there and you can have two sets of eyes on it until you get comfortable. 
Because again, not all houses are perfect squares and rectangles. So maybe consider trying to start with a ranch, right? Start with something a little bit more basic. And then when you get to that two story where the second story is bigger than the first and there's a below grade basement, da da da, maybe that's, those are the ones that you consider, the hectagon, those are the ones that you consider having the appraiser. But if you can get good at the basic, you know, squares and rectangle houses, your basic ranch floor plan, that might be helpful too. Other comments, questions on measuring? Everybody good on the homework assignment, one of the homework assignments. Again, still working with sellers. Another thing we need to do is help the seller determine how much to list their home for. Um, they're gonna rely on you. The seller thinks they know, the seller knows what the home is worth to them. Guys, please understand to the seller, this is their home. Blood, sweat, and tears went into this home. Remember when little Johnny fell right there and scraped his knee? Oh, to everybody else in the world is just a house. So the seller naturally comes into this transaction with putting more value on their home than anybody else. And this is where our opinion can help. And we offered an unbiased, unemotional opinion. And the best thing we can do to offer our opinion is to perform our comparative market analysis or our CMA. I cannot determine value. Determining value is the appraiser's job. My job is to determine probable sales price, probable selling price. Again, be very careful about the verbiage that you use. If you look at a seller and say, I think the value of your home is, you just acted like an appraiser. So unless you're an appraiser, you need to be very careful. We look for probable selling price, probable lease price, your property management, probable sales price. And doing a CMA is one of those things that requires the R and old par, reasonable skill, care, and diligence. Can I be honest? We're all friends here, right? Let's be honest with each other. If you've not had experience in doing CMAs yet, let me tell you guys, I can pretty much manipulate these things to say whatever I want them to say. If I want to make a value or probable sales price at this, I can, I can make it happen. Is that necessarily practicing reasonable skill, care, and diligence? No, I need to select good comps. I need to select a good area. I need to select good criteria to compare it to, right? Um, when I do a CMA, I start with like a quarter mile of radius. And I look for certain things that I try to find similar. I try to find similar square footage and or similar year built, um, similar style ranch to a ranch. I'm not trying to compare a two-story to a condo. So we have to take some care when we do these. Winston-Salem Board of Realtors about once a quarter offers a CMA class. That CMA class is conducted by an actual appraiser. So that's a really good insight. If you haven't taken that class yet, I'm sure other boards offer something similar. I know specifically Winston. Get training from your BIC, training from your office. Again, the first couple CMAs you guys do, you shouldn't be alone. You should have some guidance. You should have some help to make sure that what you're selecting, what you're looking at is good stuff, not just anything, that you're not trying to make the numbers work. The Real Estate Commission says it is highly recommended that every listing agent do a CMA probably to advising the seller on the appropriate listing price. You guys want an inside scoop? My office has started 
getting seller initials on the CMAs. So not only do we provide the seller with the CMA, we've started saying, now that we've discussed it, can you please initial here? Talk about a CYA, my goodness. <laughs> We're also doing CMAs for buyers too, aren't we? When the buyer looks at you and says, this is my house, this is the dream house, how much should I offer? You just gonna tell them to offer asking price? I hope not. In this market, are you gonna say, well, if you go in 30,000 over, you'd be all right. I hope not. I hope your response is an educated response and how you come up with an educated response is you do a CMA. And while you're at it, why not have your buyer initial it too? Does that not show that you discussed it with them? You showed it to them? Woo, that's hard to, to, to deny later. So the commission says it's highly recommended that we do a CMA before we tell the seller what we think they're, remember, we're determined probable sales price. Once we get probable sales price, we can determine the listing price based off of that. Maybe a little bit of wiggle room for negotiations. Not so much in this market. There's not much negotiating going on in this market, um, but we'll get back. We'll get back to a different market, I promise you. Um, very, that's right, Chastity. What's happening in this market, I'm not telling the buyers how much over I think they should go. I'm telling the buyers the probable sales price. Buyers are choosing to go over. And that's why I think even today, it's important that we still list the property right. The buyers are the one driving up the market, not the sellers. The sellers are getting all sorts of, of crap right now, aren't they? Everybody's out there blaming the sellers for driving up the market. They're, for the most part, are pricing it right. We're seeing asking prices come in over list price. It's the buyers driving the market up. Now you got greedy sellers out there, of course you do. But I think for the most part, they're being priced appropriately. You get 45 multiple offers, they're bound to drive up, <laughs> drive up the price. And then you get $175,000 in due diligence or something absurd like that. I only dream of that kind of money. Do you have to take a loan out to get a due diligence and then take a loan to buy a house? I don't know how that works. <laughs> I can't fathom that kind of money. I can tell you one thing, Julie Campbell has never written a check for $175,000. <laughs> Maybe not yet. <laughs> when we're doing our CMAs, those that are found to be taking shortcuts could be um, violation, license law and commission rule could face disciplinary action. When you do CMAs, whether or not you have your party's initial or not, keep it. When we get back into a more normal market, we may see homes listed for one month, two months, six months. They're not flying off the shelves in one or two days. Every single time you talk to your seller throughout the listing, Every single time you talk to your seller about price, you need to pull a current CMA because things change from month to month. Things change three months from now than where they were ago. So if you're on the market for three months and your seller says, I wonder if we should do a price drop, before you blurt an answer out, do a current CMA form. Let's talk about where the market is today versus where it was when we listed three months ago. Again, training, either both inside, in your firm, with your BIC, Part of your new agent orientation. Again, the first couple of times you do one, have somebody sit with you. And then look at your local board of realtors to see if they offer training too. I, again, I know Winston does. I can't speak for the others. So there's a couple different approaches that we can use to help the seller, uh, specifically talking about the seller. A couple different approaches we can use to help the seller arrive at this probable sales price. And the first approach the appraisers use is called the sales comparison approach. This is the most closely related to our CMAs. The sales comparison approach is the most closely related to what we do, the CMA. We'll talk about CMAs in just a minute. 
the sales comparison approach takes the subject property and studies the subject property. The subject property is the one I'm getting ready to list, the one I'm trying to define probable sales price. The subject property may also be the one that the buyer is getting ready to write the offer on. That's the property that I'm studying. And then we want to find recently sold comparable properties, also known as comps. We want recently sold nearby as similar to the subject as we can. Let me just go ahead and get this out there. No two properties are exactly the same. You're never gonna find an exact match. Even in your cookie cutterist of neighborhoods, you're never gonna find an exact match. So understanding that there are gonna have to be some variables, some adjustments. The reason we look at recently sold comparable properties, similar properties nearby, recently sold, while I don't know what a buyer may be willing to pay for my subject property, studying the recently sold comps tells me what a buyer did pay for a similar property nearby. So I use that as kind of my gauge. The sales comparison approach is the most commonly used one when we're studying single family residential homes. The exception to this may be new construction. Until you get a couple closed in the new construction community, you may not have a similar property nearby. Let's say your closest neighborhood to your new construction was built about the 60s. Is it fair to compare something that was built into the 60s to something that was built in 2022? Have things changed since the 60s? Absolutely. So if you have a new construction community and there's nothing new nearby, you may not be able to do the sales comparison approach until you get some closings in that community, in that neighborhood. As we said, the subject property is a property that we're studying. Comp specifically, I'm looking for recently sold. That's what I wanna know. I don't know what a buyer is gonna pay for this property, but I can tell you what a buyer was willing to pay for that property and that property and that property. And we can use that as a guide to help us arrive at a um, probable sales price for our sellers. The comps that were studied are recently closed. They're reflective of the current market conditions. Usually we try not to go back six months, more than six months. With low inventory it means I have fewer closings though, right? So I may have to go back more than six months. I may have to go out further than a quarter mile radius. I always start, small. I think of this as like a Google search. If you kind of start here and you're not finding what you're looking for, then you add to your Google search, right? Kind of the same thing when you're studying comps. You start with a quarter mile radius. If you can't find what you're looking for, you may have to go back to further. In closings, you may have to go out further on your radius, but kind of start small and work your way out. And the comps need typical financing. There was a period of time, let's see, 2000, 2006, 2005, something like that, appraisers, comps would not look at a foreclosure. And then about 2008 or so, the housing market crashed. Were foreclosures typical in the housing market crash? Yeah. So during that time, foreclosure, short sales were typical financing. Now we've gotten out of that little bit. We're not seeing as many foreclosures, as many short sales. I fear, if my crystal ball could speak for a second, I fear that result of this market 
we're going to see foreclosures and short sales in our near future. I can't tell you exactly when. My crystal ball is good, but it ain't that clear. I can't tell you exactly when we may see that, but I'd be willing to bet we're going to see more of those come back. So when they come back, they're going to be typical financing to that market. Does that make sense to you guys? If you only have one foreclosure in the neighborhood, I wouldn't count it. If you have five, you need to pay attention. As we said, comps should be similar, as similar to the subject that we can find. Some variable things that we may want to consider looking at is the age. Again, the more importance here, new construction. Um, location. We want as nearby as we can. I can't compare value or probable sales price to property in Kernersville when I'm trying to study a property in Winston-Salem. I could put a value on a home in Winston-Salem, pick up that home and move it to Kernersville, and it's going to have a different value on it, right? Because I moved the location. So that's why we want to study things nearby. Um, size, we're looking at square footage of the home. How big are the lots? Land plays a value. Land plays a piece when you're putting price on property. Some physical characteristics you might want to consider. Um, how many bedrooms? Does it have a garage? Does it have a fireplace? Does it have a pool? Again, you want similar properties. I want to compare a ranch to a ranch. I don't want to compare a ranch to a condo. The condition of the property. This is where pictures help. If you look at MLS, there's a history. And hopefully agents are putting pictures in. Again, I fear in this market, it's not happening as much, but hopefully we're putting pictures back in. We can use those pictures to get an idea for the condition of the inside of the closed comps to help us give an idea how our comp relates. For those of you that are practicing, have you had a seller look at you yet and say, oh, but the house down the street closed for, Okay, well, what's different? Is it different when you walk inside? Is the house down the street exactly like yours? Is it better? Is it worse? Uh, are there a nearby amenities? Um, is there a possible membership to a pool or a clubhouse? What amenities, what features are nearby? The date of sale, again, we're looking for recently sold. Start with six months. If you have to go back further, you have to go back further. But the rule of thumb says to start with six months. And then the condition of the sale, we're looking for a typical open market transaction. If foreclosures are the normal, then foreclosures are typical. But again, if you have one in the entire neighborhood in the last two years, foreclosures aren't that typical, are they? So we wouldn't want to consider that. Each market brings different things for us to study. Questions so far? Okay, so let's take our break. Uh, let's come back at 310. We'll talk more about CMAs and BPOs, including getting into license law and commission rule on CMAs and BPOs.
You guys are back, You're back. John, was it you that just sent me the text? That was Donna. Send oh, me another text telling me it's Donna. Send me another text telling me it's you. <laughs> I don't know who to give credit to. <laughs> Thank you. So John's, what's John asking me here? That's the hallmark, sorry. Oh, okay. All right. But you're going to email it to me or text it to me? Yeah, yeah. I typically don't go back and look at chats unless I have to. So if there's any relevant information in there, I'm not going to get it. Especially like pre-licensing. Sometimes I leave with like a 20-page PDF on the chats. Who's sitting there and reading that? Not this girl. <laughs> I read it once in class, you know. All right. So my name. Thank you. So um, yeah. So we're already getting homework. So checking off your list, right? That's all right. I'm getting ready to give you another homework assignment too. So you can <laughs> there's just the two for the class. All right. Um, so our comps need to be similar to the subject, as similar as we can. We always want to try to find three to four good comps understanding that you know each market each condition each location can be a little bit different if you're in an area which i believe we are but if you're in an area that has mls you can refer you can rely on the mls uh triad mls came about late 90s they've never deleted anything Obviously studying something back in the 90s isn't gonna help us today, but my point is, is that history stays in MLS. So if it's ever hit MLS before, it can be found forever. Not all areas have a local MLS. So they may have to rely on the previous closed property files of their office. Um, the, I'm guessing these are like smaller areas in the world, smaller areas in the state, they may not have as much competition, uh, but they have to rely on office files pretty much if they don't have an MLS. And then we want to find the sales price of the closed comps, what was a buyer willing to pay for it, and again, the property information. And that's where the MLS sheet can come into handy, because now we can do, all right, three bed, three bed, three bed, three bed, or this square footage range or this year range, whatever you want to take into consideration. When we're looking at good comps, when I'm trying to find probable sales price, please understand we're only looking at closed comps. Active comps are important when I'm talking with a seller. Active, not even comps, I'm sorry, active properties and under contract properties are important when I'm talking with the seller because that tells us our competition, right? If the house across the street is for sale and the seller wants to know their competition, then we're gonna study the heck out of the house across the street. So we can try to get my seller under contract before their neighbor. That tells us our competition. What active and under contract comps don't tell us is what a buyer's willing to pay for it. And that's where the closed comps come into handy because we get sales prices. When we're talking with sellers to come to asking price, um, expired properties might be good to look at too. What would an expired property tell me? That it, that maybe it was overpriced or exactly i don't know i wasn't there but what i can tell you plumber is at this price we didn't close did offers come in and the sellers not accept them i don't know but what i know is at this price we didn't close so back to my scenario before lunch i was talking about my sellers i gave them a probable selling price of 95 to 100 and they said oh we want 135 remember those guys if I had expired comps with me, which there was nothing in that area, of course, but what if I had expired comps of that amount? I can say, guys, look, other people have tried to sell for 135 
and they weren't successful. So we can use those expired. Again, you guys, I've no fault to the seller whatsoever. This is their home that we're talking about. They have more value in it than anybody else. So we need to help get them down <laughs> to the level of everybody else. I don't know much about life, but I know numbers don't lie. So as long as you're pulling reliable comps, as long as you're looking at those numbers, at those figures, we can help give the seller um, an opi our opinion of the best price that we can get for them. When you're studying the comps, never, ever, ever, ever adjust the subject. We always adjust the comps to match the subject. So let's say, for example, this is our subject property. All the features of the subject property. And that line is gonna stay straight the entire time. I'm never adjusting the subject property. And let's say I study a comp that has features that are superior to the subject. The comp has superior features. Maybe it has more square footage. Maybe it has a, an extra bedroom, maybe whatever. It has something superior to the subject. What I need to do is take that superior comp and adjust it down to match the subject. I'm not adjusting the subject to match the comp. I'm adjusting the comp to match the subject. Similarly, if I had an inferior comp, something with less square foot, maybe my subject has two, ba two bathrooms and comp two has one and a half baths. It's something less than. In order to adjust my comp to match my subject, I need to add to it. My subject never ever changes. I always adjust my comps to match my subject. You guys know the hand trick? Do you know the hand trick? Let's do the hand trick. You guys push yourselves back a little bit so you don't like punch the screen, right? I'm gonna give, give, give you some room here. Take your left hand, make a fist. Hold it straight out in front of you. Straight out in front of you. We're never, we're gonna call our left hand our subject property and we're never gonna adjust it, right? Subject property. Take your right hand, make a fist and hold it straight over your head. Which is more, your right hand or your left hand? Your right hand. How do you make your right hand left your match hand? You deduct. You lower it, you with me? Superior comp, something, this has four bedrooms, this has three. The subject has three, the comp has four. How do I make my comp match my subject? I deduct a bedroom. Similarly, if you take your right hand, shake it off, make a fist, hold it down by your side. Which is higher, subject or comp two? Now your subject is, your subject has three bedrooms, your comp has two. How do I make my comp match my subject? I add, I increase. Did my left hand ever move? Your left hand will go to sleep before you're, I'm done with you, right? Your left hand is never, ever gonna move. We're adjusting our comps. Inferior, we adjust up. Superior, we adjust down. Do the hand trick. Okay, you're done. You guys are waiting for the next. No, that's it. Exercise over. <laughs> um, again, this is one of your homework assignments. Not math you're going to see on your test. Uh, but this is one of your homework assignments where we can adjust comps. We'll see that in just a second. Any questions? See, conferences are good. <laughs> I learned a new trick and I incorporate it. <laughs> Okay, you like the hand trick? <laughs> um, so adjusting the comps, again, never ever adjust the subject, always adjust the comps to match the subject. Again, just things we wanna study, we've kind of been through these. Age and condition, you know, when I'm, do, when I'm looking at year built, I tend to go within a 10, 15, 20 year 
range. I don't like to go much past 20, high or low. I usually start with a 10 year range, 10 high, 10 low, kind of go from there. Location, location, location. Again, I, you know, depending on the density, the population, I try to start with a quarter of a mile radius, maybe a subdivision. If it's a large enough subdivision, I can just look at that one subdivision. I don't want to go too far out, though. I certainly don't want to go, you know, five miles out or anything, if I can help it. Um, size of the building, not just the structure, but also the lot. Remember, the lot has value, too. The structure doesn't take up the entire lot. So the lot has value as well. There are major physical characteristics, um, type of construction. What are some major features, square footage, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms? Again, I tend to start tight and expand as needed. Date of the sale, try to stick with six months. This market, it's hard. Low inventory means less closings. So we may have to go back further than six months. And then conditions of sale. That's what pictures help for. Um, do I ever use the features in MLS to do my CMA? All the time. But just because I have a closed comp doesn't mean it's a good comp, right? So I could have 15 closed comps nearby, but I need to study those closed comps to see which one would give me a good comp. Do you know what I'm talking about, though? The there's a, yeah. yeah, that. but you know what? The last one I did like that, it took my subjects wait well not my subject I guess my comps were way out you know what I'm like when location they, when it, all, like, yeah yeah like when it pulled it in and, and and a lot of that may depend on the area again that's you know an unfortunate result of low inventory you know yeah. we don't have as many closings right so you may have to go a little bit further out um, for sale by owners aren't in MLS typically they may go in as a um, for comp purposes only, that's what that means. If you're a buyer's agent, your firm may want to put the FISBO in just for comp, closed comp purposes only, but otherwise, you know, they're not in there. Hmm. Um, so there's, there's a lot, which is why I tell you guys to get more training to, you, you know, the, the, again, the first one you do is going to be painful. <laughs> the second one might be a little easier, but the more you do, you tend to kind of, especially if you're familiar with your area, your market, you can tend, kind of tend to know better what to look for. So what we mean by that, Donna, here's a picture. And, and I, let's see, this is from a while ago. I don't remember when I pulled this, but this is uh, Hastings Hill Road, Sedge Garden in Kernersville. You guys like, like 421 or Salem Parkway is like right about in here somewhere. Um, so this is just, and if my subject property were in here somewhere, I have, goodness, I have 27 closed comps. That doesn't mean all 27 of these are good comps. So now that I've done my radius search and however I got this, you know, wherever my subject property is, let's just pretend for a second that it's, you know, right here. I may want to look at these first, right? Because they're the closest. And then I can come out, maybe look at the, you know, of these 27, I sure hope I can find three to four good comps. And that's where we're doing. We're starting big. You know, hopefully you have lots to choose from. If you did this search and you only had one closed comp, you may need to go out a little further. You may need to go back. A little further. Honestly, if I were doing this, I would find a figure out to tighten it up a little bit. Maybe put in the number of bedrooms, maybe put in similar to your built. 27 is a lot. So somehow I need to pare that down a little bit. And that's what I mean by expand on it or tighten it up a little bit. This particular map, we don't have active, we don't have expired. Um, I don't remember if that's what I searched for or not, but we get the idea. I pulled my subject, I pulled the comps. And I thought, goodness, that's a lot to deal with. I need to hone in a little bit. Maybe I can redraw my lines to you know, cut off these properties back here, right? Tighten it up a bit.
but yeah, to your point, again, try it MLS. I don't know about others, but try it MLS. We have a cool feature called Quick CMA. You put in your subject property, your radius, and your criteria, and it gives you the results, which is what you're looking at right here. And then from that, you can pull a report. You can have MLS generate a report that gives you the, you know, how many square feet is the home? What are the acres you're built? That kind of thing. So remember you guys, I'm not an appraiser. I'm not putting value on stuff, but I can make mental adjustments, right? I don't know what the cost of is, is a bed of a bedroom in this area. I have no clue. That's the appraiser's job. But I can say, well, all these have four bedrooms and my subject has three. So they should have a more value than my subject, right? I'm making mental adjustments, not actual number adjustments. That's the appraiser's job. And I think that's one thing with the CMA. Again, I can make that thing produce any report that I want it to. But reasonable skill, care, and diligence says that I'm putting thought into it. I'm putting, you know, consideration into what comps I'm looking at. You can print that quick CMA to take to your seller. If I were you, I would take the properties, sheets of the properties of the closed comps that you decide on. Take the photo gallery. Take the property information. So you can tell your seller, okay, this is my CMA. But this is where I think, this is where I got this information. This is the information that I have to rely on. Appraisers use the same MLS that we do. So it's so important, you guys. Yet another good reason that we're putting our information in accurately because it helps price our market. That's what the appraisers are looking at. And if we're putting in a bunch of wrong information or no pictures, the appraiser doesn't have anything to go on. The appraiser can go on the subject property, but they're not going in closed properties. Could you imagine if you bought a house and then you had some dude knocking on your door saying, I'm an appraiser and I want to look inside? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sometimes the appraisers can study comps. Typically what we're going to do is compare comp to subject, comp to subject. But sometimes the appraisers can study comps to help them see differences in the comps. So we got closed comp was at 530 Creekside. Another closed comp was at 570 and Court. The difference the appraiser discovered in the comps is the square footage. The appraiser determined everything else was the same. Um, but closed comp two is bigger than closed comp one. Thus, the sales price was more expensive on closed comp because it's more square foot, right? Does this make sense? Um, seller concessions, those are seller pay closing costs, those affect the sales price. We'll see those come back in different markets too. So now we have two comps. My subject is pretty much smack dab in the middle, isn't it? with square footage. So if I can find some information just by studying the comps, then that can help the appraiser arrive at a price. So what the appraiser would do is first off, find the difference of the sales price. Close comp two, close for uh, 180, comp one, close for 126. That's a difference of $54,000. Comp two had 1,700 square feet. Comp one had 1,215. Different square feet, $485. I take my 54,000, divide it by 485, and the appraiser can determine in this area that we can adjust for $111 per square foot. They found the difference. They found the one thing that separated these comps, and they use that to help them arrive so I must be doing it wrong what you got well what I did was found out what they sold it per square foot is what I did and then I on each one and then both of them were 
like 105, one of them was 105.88 and one was 106.17 per square foot. And then I just multiplied that times 1,500. And what did you get? Well, I came yes. up with a sales price possibly of 159, 255. But so if we were to take this 111 per square foot and use that, this might have been what you did, <laughs> use that to make the adjustments, right? So yes, now that yes. I know $111 per square foot, I can make a square foot adjustment of comp one. What's the difference in the subject and comp one? There's a difference of 285 square feet. You take that times 111. The subject has 1500, comp one has less than that. So what do I do to make my comp match my subject? I add, I increase. And then again, we do that with comp two. My comp has 1700, my subject has 15. My subject has 15, comp two has 17, more than, right? So how do I make that match? How do I make that match my subject? I deduct. So now our numbers are looking a little closer, aren't they? We got a range now, and this is me rounding. So 157, 635, 157.8, 8, we could probably round up. I would report a probable sales price to my seller based on the difference of square footage, based on these comps of 157. 500 to 159. Julie, Again, go back. Go back. Can you go back to the previous page just so I can take a picture? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And I'll put, uh, if I don't do it this evening, I'll do it tomorrow morning, maybe tomorrow morning. But I'll put my PowerPoints and learn test pass for you guys so you have them as well. Again, you guys, this is the difference in me and the appraiser. I don't know what a, what a square foot is, right? I don't know the value of a square foot. I don't know the value of a fireplace. If you really want to know the values of things, go to appraisal school. Questions on this? Before I forget, because I know me. So the assignment is going to be to do a CMA, you said? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're going to give that to us? You can find that CMA in Learn Test Pass. Oh, I missed Under it. the Section 2 material. Okay. I don't know what the difference is between these at a glance, they look the same to me, but how about we just all agree we're gonna do the post 301 CMA. I, I don't know how two of them got in here. I need to get with Jane. Um, but how about we all agree under the section two material, we'll do the post 301 CMA worksheet 2022. There's your second homework assignment. So we're told, we have instructions, always read the directions first. I read through the material, pick only the best comps and make the adjustments. So it gives us our subject property. And then it gives us four different comps to study. And then it tells us the adjustments. Again, we're not an appraiser. It gives us the value, right? We need to know. So it gives us the value. So we can go through the comps. If we think it's a good comp, I'm not saying all these are good comps. There may be one that's not good at all, which we're going to throw away, right? Um, try to have at least three. Don't throw them all away. Um, if you can use four, that's great. Make the adjustments. And if I may make a suggestion, when I'm doing this kind of homework, I set myself up with nice, neat rows and columns. So I got, for example, my subject, comp one, comp two, comp three. And then down to the side, I have, for example, a square foot, year built, number of bedrooms, number of baths. You guys see what I'm doing? 
So now I can do an actual side-by-side -side comparison. I adjust comp one as it relates to the subject. I adjust comp two as it relates to the subject. And I adjust comp three as it relates to the subject. Once you adjust your comps, it gives you the sales price of the comps, it has to. It gives you the sales price of the comps. You adjust the sales price. Now we know how the comp, the adjusted value, how the comp relates to the subject. And from there, you should be able to get a range. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, based on my research, I think your probable sales price is gonna be between this and this. So there is your second homework assignment. Not too bad, not too bad. Again, I'm not looking for right or wrong. We're just looking to see that you did it. And we'll talk about both of these when we get to back together. If not Saturday, we'll look at them Sunday before your exam, but we will talk about them. I just need in my file that you guys did them and send them to me. What do y'all think I document? You think I drink my own Kool-Aid? <laughs> you bet I do. <laughs> Real estate commission can pull my files just as well as they can yours. Questions on either homework assignment, questions on this one? Since we're here, oops. Um, another approach that the appraiser may take is the income capitalization approach. We've been talking about the sales comparison approach. We're going to come back and talk about CMAs and BPOs specifically in just a minute. Um, the appraiser may look at the income capitalization approach to help them arrive at value as well. The income capitalization approach for the appraiser is good for properties that produce and income. They collect rent. Maybe you're looking at an apartment building. Maybe you're looking at an office space, a retail center. They're properties that generate rent. And the theory behind the income capitalization approach says that the value of the property can be based, determined on how much rent it collects, how much income does it produce. Usually the income capitalization approach is best for five or more units, five or more dwellings or units in, in a space, residential or commercial. I'm sorry, income capitalization approach, I'm looking right at it. I'm sorry, it's more than one to four. Um, if you're doing anything more than five, you may need to look at a different approach. The appraiser may need to look at a different approach. I wouldn't do good in appraisal school, would I? <laughs> and one thing that the income capitalization approach does is looks at uh, net operating income and the capitalization rate. Each investor has a different desired capitalization rate. Basically, the capitalization rate says how long before I get my money back. I paid for this investment property. How long do I have to pay on it? How much rent do I have to collect before I can get my money back? If you're an investor with only one investment property, all your eggs are in that basket, right? You're gonna have a very low tolerance. Somebody skips rent, you can't pay the bills. If you're an investor with 20 investment properties, you may have a higher tolerance because you could have 19 producing an income and one that's not, those 19 can carry that one. So the capitalization rate's subjective. It could vary from investor to investor, what they hope to eventually capture, eventually get their money back. When investor is deciding to purchase, they may or may not know certain pieces 
to give them their net operating income or their capitalization rate. So another tool that the investor might use is something called the gross rent multiplier. The gross rent multiplier again is for investment property. It again looks at the subject property. What is the investor thinking about purchasing? And it looks at sold or rented comps nearby. What the gross rent multiplier does is tell the investor, if I pay this much and I have an estimated rental income, how many years before I get my money back? If I'm gonna pay this much, my sales price, and I expect to collect this much rent this year, how many years, how many months before I can get my money back? The formula for the gross rent multiplier is just take the sales price and divide it by the rental income. If your rental income is residential, I mean, if your property is residential, the rental income is probably monthly. If it's commercial, the rental income is probably annually. Again, the question is that the GRM gross rent multiplier answers is how many months or how many years before I get my money back? And it's based on rent collected on properties nearby. Did you guys know, for those of you that are in MLS, try it MLS, there's a for rent tab. You can find rental properties when you search. There's a whole for rent section in the Triad MLS. So similarly, similarly, the CMAs that we do, we could do that for rent properties as well, where we have rented properties and how much the properties are renting for. So back to our income capitalization approach, also known as our direct capitalization. You will see this on your test. This is one of your math questions on your test. Y'all don't say I never did anything for you. Here's a test question. You are going to be asked to find either, uh, probably the value. You're going to be asked to find the value of the property using the income capitalization approach, also known as the direct capitalization. Before you can find the value, you first have to find the net operating income. Y'all remember this one? How do you find the net operating income? Well, you know this formula. I suggest sometimes between now and Sunday, get you a flashcard, put the formula on the flashcard, put it in your pocket and take it everywhere you go with you this week. Because if you don't know the formula, you don't know what to do with these numbers. Somehow we got to get you to memorize a formula. This formula is always calculated annually. So if they give you monthly figures, how do you convert monthly to annual? Multiply by 12. You take monthly rent times by 12 to get annual rent. This formula starts at looking at the potential gross income, also known as the PGI, potential gross income. Potential gross income is the dream. If I were collecting rent on time every time from all my tenants, all units are rented and all tenants are paid, what's the most I can make this year? 100% occupancy. 100% of the time. That's your potential gross income. You have a question? From your potential gross income, you deduct your vacancy. Is the reality you, you have some vacancy sometimes? Is the reality is sometimes you got to chase a tenant around trying to get rent? So the PGI is the dream. You deduct your vacancy and collection losses 
collection losses, if you got to take a tenant to court to get them out or to get them to pay, that gives you your effective gross income. Your effective gross income is your reality. The PGI is the max you can collect. The EGI is what you're actually collecting. So you have to account for vacancies. You have to account for delinquent tenants. That gives you each other. Everybody good with that? PGI is the dream, 100% occupancy, 100% of the time. Minus your vacancy and collection losses to give you your reality, your effective gross income. Did From you your say EGI? Yeah. Got a question. Um, sure. Did you say it will probably say monthly, but we need to convert that to? I didn't say probably. I said if it if, says monthly, if, you if. need to know how to convert it to annual. Okay. How do you convert monthly to annual? Just multiply by 12. From your EGI, you deduct your operating expenses, your marketing, your advertising, your managerial fees. And when you deduct your operating expenses from your effective gross income is when you get your net operating income, NOI. By the way, for the most part, things that you may see are gonna be your operating expenses, except for your um, principal and interest payment, except for your debt service. Debt service doesn't count under operating expenses. Property taxes and homeowners insurance do, or insurance on the property counts, but principal and interest payments do not. Y'all have this written down? getting ready for next week. I'm just trying to figure out how do I read this in, in a straight line because it's, it's a little confusing for me reading it here. So gross income equals the, uh, yep. the uh, um, sorry, direct capitalization is gross income minus this first ratio, vacancy and collection issues effective growth, minus this second ratio. Is that correct? Your gross income minus your vacancy gives you your effective gross income. Effective okay. gross income minus operating expenses gives you your net operating income. Okay. You so give me a, a second step. to write that down because sure. right gross now I'm reading it minus completely differently. Equals effective gross income. Effective gross income minus your operating expenses gives you your net operating income. Poor Violet eats Oreos nightly. Because <laughs> remember this says potential gross income. So poor Violet eats Oreos nightly, if that helps you with the uh, order. I'm, I'm still not there yet, please bear with me. Of course. So potential gross income minus vacancy and collection losses equals effective gross income. Correct. Okay. And then effective gross income minus operating expenses equals net operating income. He's got it. Okay, thank you. This is pre license and stuff. Remember? <laughs> unit 17. We all went, ah, oh, not unit 17 again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Unit 17 again. Nobody wants to sign up for appraisal school after I'm done with them in unit 17. <laughs> Julie, and yeah. operating. Operating expenses, you just said principal and interest don't count towards that. Correct. But, but what all does count towards that? Managing, managerial expenses, marketing, advertising, janitorial. Okay. okay. Real property taxes, decorating expenses. H HOA. If, if applicable, if HOA. Okay. okay. 
uh, gotcha. insurance, property insurance. Okay, thank you. Does learn test pass have an example of the numbers? I don't know, but I do. So we're getting ready to do one. Okay. Never fear. <laughs> Everybody good? Everybody with me so far? So once we know how to find the net operating income, then we can find the value. Net operating income divided by the capitalization rate is gonna give you the value. The value is based on the income that the property is generating. So it's gonna be a two-step problem, right? They're gonna give you the cap rate. They're gonna ask you for value. They're not gonna give you the NOI. They're gonna expect you to find the NOI. How do you find the NOI? You get to use this formula first. So it's a two-part. Okay, you guys got this written down? So let's go ahead and take a break. Let's get, come back with a fresh mind. When we come back, we're gonna use these formulas and I'll let you use the formula today. You don't have to have it memorized until next Sunday. So you got a whole week to do nothing else but memorize that formula, right? And as you're practicing, I'm okay with you using the formula. If you, let me rephrase that. If you wanna get this test question right, <laughs> this week you gotta memorize the formula so you can get that. So you know what to do with the numbers. So let's go ahead and take 10. Uh, and when we come back, we'll look at a formula. I'll give you guys a minute to do one uh, and then we'll work through it together. So let's see, I got 353. Let's come back at 404. And uh, we'll look at this and we'll finish up the day. Goodness, it's four o'clock already.
All right, how are we doing for the last hour? So I got a problem. Uh, we're going to work. And actually, don't look at that just yet. Don't look, don't look. Okay. Pay no attention to the man behind the screen. If we look, I want to say, don't hold me to this, but if you're doing the little quizzes within the sections of Learn Test Pass, I want to say there might be an extra problem in there. You also got a sample in your book on the direct. Um, I just saw it on page, it's in chapter 15. So what we're talking about right now is in chapter 15. Five thirty-one. Five, yeah, 531, yep, that's right. So you can kind of use that as well. The key is knowing that formula. If you know the formula, you know what to do. But like I said, hopefully you guys are, um, we won't quite finish up with sellers today. Sellers are the biggest section of this class. So we're gonna spend the most time. We won't quite finish with sellers today. So when we come back together on Saturday, we'll finish sellers. We'll talk about working with buyers and then dual agency property management uh, and then other topics. So um, obviously whatever we don't finish Saturday, we'll finish Sunday. And then we'll have a chance to do a quick review and then the last hour we're together next Sunday will be your test. So we'll talk about that as well. So you guys got some scratch paper right there. You got a calculator. If you're using your phone today, I'm okay with that. Just remember for your exam, I can't let you use your phone. So find you a basic calculator for your test next week. The reason I can't let you use your phone is because your phone's got Google. So here's a problem. You guys take, everybody take a few minutes, work this out. Uh, you have the formulas right in front of you. Use those formulas as your guide. Take a few minutes and consider this, uh, and then we'll come back together and talk about it.
And when you have a solution, if you want to tell me your answer in a private chat, or if you at least want to tell me you're done, let me know when you're done somewhere so I can make sure everybody had a chance. I knew what you meant. <laughs> Donna, your answer is in the problem. So we'll read just a little bit further. Okay, I've heard from all of you. So uh, we've gotten through it. So let's see what we got. Uh, when I do math, if I can offer some advice. When I do math, when I see a math problem on an exam, the very first thing I do is put my pencil down and read the question. Just read the question. Don't try to start doing something with numbers until you've read through it and you know what the question is asking you. So what we have here is a 10 unit, four story apartment building utilizes the following rental schedule. There are three first floor apartments that rent for 650 per month. There are three second floor apartments that rent for 900 per month. There are three third floor apartments that rent for 1,100. And then the penthouse on the fourth floor rents for 1,800 per month. 
Uh, vacancy averages 5% per year. Operating expenses, spec expenses are 1100 per month. Capitalization rate is 12%. Based on this information, what is the value of the building? So we know. The other thing I like to do when I do math is typically start with where I want to end. What am I solving for? My unknown variable is value, right? That's what I care about. What are the two components I need to solve for value? Net operating the, income and cap rate. That's exactly right. So I need the net operating income and I need the capitalization rate. The problem tells me the capitalization rate is 12%. You guys see what I'm doing? I'm filling in what I know. Do I know the net operating income? Not yet. So now that tells me I need to go back to the problem and get some more information. Everybody with me so far? I'm kind of dissecting this. I'm breaking this down. So now we got to rely on our formula to know that to find the net operating income. So we start with looking at our potential gross income. This is a 10 unit building. So my potential gross income is if I have all 10 of these units rented out all the time. So we need to figure out our annual potential gross income. And they break it down. They tell me I got three on the first floor that rent for 1,000 or 650 per month, which shakes out to 1,950 per month. How do I convert monthly to annual? I times by 12. 12. Yep, so my first floor is gonna give me a potential for 23,000. My second floor again has three units that rent for 900 a month. We're looking at 2,700 monthly times by 12 to get annually. My third floor again has three units. These rent for 1100 per month. Times 12 to get annual. You see what I'm doing? I'm figuring out if I were collecting rent every month on time, every time, how much am I making? And then that penthouse goes for 1800 per month, 12 months. So my penthouse is going for $2,160. When I add all of this up, I get a PGI, a potential gross income of $117,000. This is so far so good, I like this. This is the max I can make on this building. If I collect all rent on time, every time, what's the most I can make this year? $117,000. That's what we mean by potential gross income. Can I collect more than that? Not without raising the rent, right? Not without adjusting these numbers. Questions so far? If only I'd transcribed the numbers right. I've got everything right that you did, but the three by 900, I wrote 1800. So I'm off there right away. Uh, <laughs> I did the math wrong there. That's know, okay. Right, you know what she did. See, that's good. That's the concept, good. I, I had the concept, yeah. That's good. We like the concept. You know, we're yeah. all human. We make mistakes, right? But as long as you got the concept, yeah. yeah. I heard you go, oh. Yeah, so, when you did that, I was like, like, oh, no. Sound? I like that sound because that's you learning. That's your little yeah. light bulb clicking on. That's what that sound was. So I like light bulbs. <laughs> From our PGI, we deduct vacancy. The problem tells me I have 5%. So if you take your 117,000 times 5%, you're gonna get a vacancy of 5,000, where am I? $850, that's your vacancy. When I deduct that from my PGI, I get an EGI of $111,150. The potential is 117, 
the reality is $111,150 because I do have some vacancy. Guys, even your best tenant may move out. And if your best tenant moves out, you need at least a couple of weeks to turn around and get it cleaned up and get another tenant in there, right? So vacancies are very, very common in a rental situation. Questions on how I got the EGI? Deducted our vacancy. The problem tells me that my operating expenses are 1100 per month. I need to convert that to annual. So I times by 12 to get operating expenses of 13,200. Those are my annual operating expenses. I can deduct that from my EGI, operating expenses. When I deduct operating expenses from EGI, I get a net operating income of $97,950. That's the missing piece to my puzzle, isn't it? So now I can put my NOI, we just determined 97,950. I take that, divide it by 12%, make sure you hit the percent key, divided by 12%. And based on this income producing property, we can determine that the value of the building is worth $816,250. The income capitalization approach says the value is based on the income it collects. If the rent goes up, the value is going to go up. If the rental rate goes down, maybe my vacancy losses, my vacancy gets bigger and I have more vacancies than occupancies. I, I asked you guys yesterday, nobody put your hand up and I don't blame you. It doesn't seem like I have anybody on this call going into property management. Um, I don't have many people ever going into property management. It's a different world and it's a lot of looking at numbers. It's a lot of looking at numbers because you think about what do investors care about? And yeah, investors care about their money. And it's not just about the bottom line, is it? So this is absolutely a tool that you will see next Sunday afternoon. Hey, Julie, just yes. a quick thing. When Please. I got, when I did the PGI, what uh -huh. I did, a I first got, you know, the monthly rents. I added those up and then I just timed it times 12. I still got the 117. Perfect. I just think it was just a less step than going each one going by 12. Perfect. Yep. However you see that. I see it this way. You see it that way. As long as we got the end result. Thank you for sharing that. That's one thing I like about math is there's more than one way to see it. Quite frankly, I don't care how you get there. If you got the 100 or 816,250, my question is, if you didn't get it, do you see where you went wrong? Can we use this as a learning experience? And that's what I asked. I got Donna over here cussing. So, but you saw it now, right? <laughs> as long as you see it, that's the important thing. <laughs> yeah, I just forgot to multiply the. Um operating expenses by and that's 12. kind of the trickery okay. of the problem you, you know because they throw in these per months and that's why i think sometimes just taking a minute and reading the problem is going to cue you into some of those words y'all don't get in a hurry this is a lot of information don't get a hurry and skip around and skip ahead once you read the problem you pick up your pencil and start doing with this other questions or comments I did the same thing, Donna. Donna, did you get $917,083? She did. <laughs> so you didn't you missed the per month too there? I got you. We'll have to remember that for the test. I was gonna say this is why I want you guys making these mistakes today and not next week, right? It's frustrating when you know the formula and when you know to do it, but it's that one thing that just throws you off. So use it as a learning experience. Everybody have the solution? May I erase this? Everybody good? Okay.
Uh, there is another math that you will see. We won't get that until next week, um, next, not Saturday. We'll try to get to it Saturday because I want you to have a minute. Um, but again, the homework assignments, the square footage and the CMA, and then for the math, you'll see a direct capitalization. And then next week, we're gonna look at, when we talk about buyers, we're gonna talk about qualifying ratios. So we'll get to see those next week for your, for your test as well. So remember the sales comparison approach, the income capitalization approach are tools of the appraiser. In this class, we're not discussing the cost approach. The cost approach you'll remember from pre-licensing is the third method that appraisers can use. Uh, we're not getting into that one in this class, but just remember that that one exists. Uh, the ones we talked about were the sales comparison approach and the income capitalization approach. Appraisers tools. Let's bring this home to me and you. What do we do? We do CMAs or BPOs. I'm not finding value. I'm finding probable sales price and I'm using the information, the check the boxes and MLS to help find my, to help do my CMAs or BPOs. So we need to take a minute and talk about some law and rule. There's both license law and commission rule that applies to CMAs, because when we are doing these for our clients, for our consumers, we need to make sure that we're doing them accurately. I, I, again, you guys, I'm not kidding. I can make these things say whatever I want to. Is that practicing reasonable skill, care, and diligence? No, you need to make sure that you're doing these properly. Every property is different. That's why I'm not sitting here telling you guys, this is how you do it because every single property is different. So a lot of it comes with experience. A lot of it comes with doing it over and over again. Get with your BIC when you start doing these. Get with a seasoned agent in your office to help you. Guys, I've been around for 20 years. And in my 20 years, I've been affiliated with three different firms. I've never worked in an office where you don't go out there and stand in the middle of the room and say, I need help and agents don't come running from all over the place to help. If you need help, all you got to do is ask. Okay? Even your seasoned agent was brand new once. So there's some rules about CMAs and BPOs that went into effect in 2012. You don't need to know that. We're coming up on 10 years old. A full broker or a broker in charge can charge a fee to do BPO or CMA. You guys as provisional brokers can do them, but you can't do it for a fee. Okay, you can do a BPO or CMA. Provisional brokers cannot charge a fee. And nobody, provisional broker, broker, or BIC can charge a fee when we're doing as part of our general brokerage duties. When you're helping your seller determine probable list price, you cannot charge a fee. When you're helping your buyer determine how much they should offer, you cannot charge a fee. Now we're gonna break down. There is a slight difference between CMA and BPO. We do not determine value. That's the appraiser's job. We cannot do a CMO or a BPA in place of a appraisal for originating a loan, refinance, or equity line of credit. We are not appraisers. We cannot determine value. Julie, so doing using language like doing a valuation is really not accurate, is it? I would proceed with caution because the appraiser is the one that can use value. Um, right. Is that language you see in your... And, and I know it's not always used properly. You know, I know we tend to say stuff and mean something else. Is that what yeah, you Yeah, that, that's but one of the, the I, I guess it's a CRM that we use. Um, my, uh, my mentor asked me to do a, a, a valuation for someone. And I'm like, mm, I think she's talking about a CMA. But She is. She is talking about a CMA. So good for you for 
having your little flag go up there, right? And notice, I mean, you're, you, you are, but you're not supposed to say that, right? Because right. that's the appraiser's job. So I just caution you, be careful when you're talking to a seller. It might be different when we're talking internally, but be careful when you're talking to a member of the public that they don't confuse this for, for value. This is why we use wordings like probable sales price, probable leasing price. If you ever get called to do a BPO or CMA for a fee, um, we need to follow license law and commission rule. Let me explain an example of when you would do one of these for a fee. Historically, once upon a time ago, there used to be a difference in a BPO and a CMA. Historically, the CMA was set aside as part of our general brokerage duties. We did CMAs for sellers to help them determine asking price. We did CMAs for buyers to help them determine how much to offer. BPOs were set aside for impartial third, third parties. You're not trying to get this listing. You're not working with this buyer. It's somebody else. They don't want to pay an appraisal to find value, but they want to pay you for your opinion for probable sales price. That's when you can charge a fee. Uh, for example, the firm I used to work for had a relocation company. The relocation company was based up in Connecticut. They had no idea what Winston-Salem looks like. Are, there good, are they a good one to determine what a probable sales price at a home in Winston-Salem is? Absolutely not. So there was an opportunity I had once where they paid me to do a BPA. All I did was offer them my opinion. I did a broker price opinion. I had no chance of getting that listing. I wasn't putting the buyer under contract. It wasn't a general brokerage duty. It was just them wanting my opinion and they were going to pay me for it. That's what we mean by doing it for a fee. You guys can do that for a third party, such as a relocation company, but you can't charge a fee for it as a provisional broker. Everybody with me? You're doing it out of the goodness of your heart. And if I were you, I would wait till you drop your provisional status before you do it, because that'll give you a little bit more experience and you can get paid. I mean, it, you know, took me a couple hours. I think I got like 250 bucks, you know, it wasn't, wasn't bad. So if you're doing it for a fee, for example, that third party relocation company, you need to make sure you're following license law and commission rule. We're getting ready to break this down in just a second. The first rule in license law and commission rule are BPAs and CMAs, BPOs and CMAs always need to be in writing? Always? Yeah. <laughs> if we could just get that in writing, that would be great. If you got verbal, you got what? Absolutely nothing that applies to your BPO CMA opinion as well. Rules also say when you're performing for a fee, you have to comply with the rules. We should comply with the rules anyway, right? But specifically, if you're being hired to do this, if you're being paid to do this, we have to comply with the rules. If you accept this assignment, you need to be knowledgeable. You need to know what you're doing. This might be a reason why they don't let PBs get paid for it, right? You guys are still learning and wrapping your brain around this stuff. They may not consider you knowledgeable, not just on the market, the area, but also on performing the CMA or the BPO themselves. I'm telling you, it takes time. So if you ever accept an outside assignment from a third party, you accept it because you feel comfortable doing it, because you have the knowledge and the experience if you're called to do one and this is your very first one ever, if you insist on doing it because you want that 250 bucks, you better have your BIC by your side, right? Whether you're getting paid or not, you always want to have your BIC by your side until you get the better hang of it.
if performing for a fee, your opinion should be free of any influence from the interested party. So it's not like the relocation company could call me and say, we need this hire. Can you adjust that? Right. I had zero influence. My instructions were pretty simple. Give us your opinion on 123 Main Street. Can you do it by Friday? Sure. When do I get paid? So your opinion should be free. You shouldn't be influenced from any interested parties. It's your opinion. When you're doing this BPO for a fee, you need to go check it out. I made an appointment. It was an active listing. I made an appointment. I previewed it, an agent preview. I didn't pretend like I had a buyer. I scheduled through showing time. And I went through the home, snapped some pictures, things that I found interesting. I looked at the outside. I drove around through the neighborhood, through the area. What we're looking for are things similar to what the appraiser uses for the sales comparison approach and the income capitalization approach. I'm looking for recently sold closed comps. Um, if there were rentals in the area, I might be able to use that rental income to help arrive at that value with the income capitalization approach. Do you have a question? No. no I kind of do about that. Um, is there any kind of scale that anybody goes by? Maybe appraisers like exterior of one through 10 and condition wise? Because, you know, just going off the computer, it'd be hard to. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I'm sure they have some kind of system. But remember, this is why it's an opinion. You know, you could have an appraiser give one opinion. You could have a different appraiser with a different opinion. You know, so something that you may see more valuable, this, you, you with me? And that's why it's an opinion. Um, what if you look at different comps than I do? Then we're going to have a different opinion. What if you look at different interior pictures? You know what I'm saying? So that's why even what the appraiser does, I mean, y'all, all the training that they go through, I'm not going to get into that. But my goodness, let me just say, it is not easy to be an appraiser. It is not easy. They go through a lot. Um, and it's making sure that they're arriving at a good, a reliable opinion. But yeah, they're all going to have different opinions and it could be based on the, the, you know, the interior, the exterior, the pictures, the condition of the property, what comps they're using. So many variables there. And I think that's what makes these tricky. I can't tell you use this comp, that comp, and that comp. You know, here's 20 comps. Which ones do you think are the best? <laughs> yeah, and then they like to call us. Where did you get your comps? Have you guys had a buyer's agent call you yet and ask you where you got your comps? I'm like, honey, I am not doing your job for you. You know, wait till you list a property. Your buyer wants to make an offer. That agent's going to call you and say, I'd like to know how you got to that number. Well, I ain't doing your job for you. Sorry. <laughs> so, what's the polite response there? Um, you, you know, how do you politely say that? I don't remember how I responded to it, but you know, I'm not I'm not representing this buyer. I mean, do I have this buyer's best interest in mind? No, I have my seller's best interest. So the fact that they even thought that I could help them, you got to remember whose side you're on here. Know who your client is, who your principal is. Well, you could just tell them you teach class. Uh... More than welcome to sign up for pre-licensing. <laughs> I teach this stuff. Here's my YouTube channel video. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so we'll just give them your number, okay? Yep, 336. <laughs> um, for a fee, when you're analyzing comps, again, a minimum of three sold or leased. Three to four closed comps is best. Two isn't enough, five is too many, right? So this is why we're not gonna analyze 20. We're gonna look at those 20 and we're gonna figure out which three or four are the best. 
we're looking for the ones that we have to make the fewest adjustments. The fewer adjustments I have to make, the more um, accurate the information Again, when you're performing for a fee, BPO, CMA for a fee, the following information needs to be included in your report. You need a description of the comps that you chose. As a matter of fact, I would print out the MLS sheet and I would attach the photo gallery pictures. You need to show what adjustments you made. You know, if it's a, um, wide range off a square foot, the question may come back, can't you find a property with closer square foot, right? How are you making these adjustments? What's the local market conditions? All markets are different. Are there a lot of foreclosures or short sales going on in your market? Is it booming? If you're pulling comps more than six months, why? Why did you go back a year? Well, it might be because we've been in incredibly low inventory for the last two years and I had to because I didn't have any closings. No inventory means few closings, right? And then the methods that you use. Did you use rely on the appraisers, your version of the appraisers sales comparison approach or the income capitalization approach? We're gonna state our findings in a range. If the range, if the higher figure exceeds the lower by more than 10%, again, explain why. What I want you to take from this slide, it should be a tight range. But if your high and low is off by more than 10%, why did you have that large of a range? The market, <laughs> we don't have inventory. Absolutely, and that very well could be the reason. This house is selling for this much and the house three down sold for this much, right? In this market, it could just pretend on the day. What's the meme I'm seeing? Y'all remember that show, um, the latest Drew Carey hosted, Whose Line Is It Anyway? And the meme I'm saying, they're saying, welcome to the 2022 real estate market where value and prices are made up and don't matter. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's pretty much sums us up, doesn't it? We're just kind of throwing numbers out there and seeing, seeing what sticks. We're throwing spaghetti at the wall. How many years do we keep records? Three, that applies to our BPOs and CMAs. We retain records of all sales, rental, other transactions for three years from the date of the conclusion. BPOs and CMAs should also be kept in our transactional file, whether you're doing it for a fee or doing it as part of your general brokerage activities. Keep it all for at least three years. If you're doing a BPO or CMA for no fee, anybody can do it. You included, provisional broker included, can do it when you're not charging a fee. But again, it's so important that we understand that nobody, provisional broker, broker, or BIC, can charge a fee when we're doing it as part of our general brokerage services. Could you imagine going to the listing appointment, you go through this whole spiel with your seller, 
you get done and the seller says, what do you think we should list for? Well, I'll answer that question as soon as you write me a check for $300. Could you imagine how well that would go over? Same thing with your buyer. Your buyer says, this is a, the perfect home. How much should I offer? I'll tell you if you give me a hundred bucks, right? I can't do that. <laughs> it's part of my general brokerage. It's my job, you guys. The only time you can charge a fee, it's for an uninterested third party. Again, the best example I have is a relocation company. Regardless of who you are, we're expected to perform these in a competent manner without any undisclosed conflict of interest. Again, although I can adjust the numbers and pretty much make them say whatever I want to, I can't. We need to perform these in a competent manner. How do you perform in a competent manner? training. Plumber's already got his uh, broker having them do these things. You guys could start, once you get access to MLS, you could pull comps on your own house, right? Put your house in as a subject property, kind of pull comps in your neighborhood or just pick a random street. Start kind of playing around and seeing the different, the different options. Make sure you get training though. I had a friend um, also who's also a real estate agent. She was contacted by um, an attorney that was representing someone in a divorce one time. And yeah. they were getting several agents from different offices to do um, nice. BPOs for court. Mm -hmm. Nice. And they can do that as long as you're not doing it to determine value to originate a loan. That's a great example, Chester. Thank you. They had no chance of getting that listing, right? They weren't doing it for the seller. They were doing it for the attorney. Great example. Thank you. And again, we're a heck of a lot cheaper than an appraiser. So why are they calling us? Money, money. Yeah, John. In that case, um, if they did give a BPO for the attorney, since it was before they signed any kind of... Um, buyer agency agreement or a um, listing agreement, could they take the listing later? Yeah, but then that would be later and that would be different. So you're doing it for the attorney versus doing it for the seller. So then if you get the call, you know, so now the attorneys proceed with the divorces going through and now we want to list it. Maybe they call you, right? So sure, that would be a different, absolutely a different relationship. Now that you're getting a call from the seller to list it, that's part of your general brokerage duties. And I would pull a new one because it might have been two weeks or two months ago when you did the other one, right? So it would be for a different, and that's another good point too. Who is asking you to do this? What's the end use for? Uh, real Estate Commission says our basic duties with CMAs or BPOs is the same. Regardless if we're doing it for a fee or not, you BB, non PB, we still have that duty to perform them competently. Basically, sums that up. So, we all have the same duty to perform these according to the Real Estate Commission's law and rules. Um, our duty under the law of agency. This goes back, falls under our reasonable skill care and diligence. The commission expects, although we may not know now how to competently perform them, the commission expects us to get training, to get the, the knowledge to know how to competently perform. And again, we, if there's any information that could influence the client's decision, disclose what we know. The law of agency echoes the law and rule of BPOs and says that we need to have the competence necessary. We need to have the right tools. 
if you don't have access to MLS, can you accept an assignment to do a CMA? Where you get, you got to get the information from somewhere. So not unless you're small town USA and you're the only real estate firm in the town where you can pull all your closed transaction files. You got to have the tools. You got to have the experience. You got to have the competency. Gee, Julie, what's the big deal? Well, the Real Estate Commission could get you for willful or negligent misrepresentation or omission. Boy, that just covers all the big four right there. They could get you for any one of them, depending on what you either falsely put information out or you withhold information. They could also get you for being unworthy or incompetent. Again, what's the commission's main purpose? To protect the public. When you're dealing with CMOs and BPAs, you're dealing with the public's money. You're dealing with either the list price or the possible offer price. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, anything one to four unit properties, single family homes, best is going to be the sales comparison approach. Again, the only single family home exception to the sales comparison approach may be new construction. If you don't have anything closed, you know, the first home in the subdivision, you're not going to be able to use a sales comparison approach. About the fifth or the sixth that's closed, if they're similar, now you can start using the sales comparison approach. In residential properties of five units or more or income producing properties. Now we're looking at the income capitalization approach. Again, additional education and experience is required. Back to performing for a fee. Again, not everybody's qualified to do it. We need to make sure that the broker is qualified. Provisional brokers can't do for a fee. You have to have an active license in good standing. Possess the knowledge and expertise. Disclose any existing conflicts of interest, the information you have that may, may affect a person's decision-making ability. You need a good knowledge of the market. You need to be aware of the trends going on in your market. This is why we study the market. This is why we're not attempting to sell North Carolina, right? And maybe you're just Winston-Salem, or maybe you're just Forsyth County. Maybe you're the triad. This goes back to the just because you can sell a house in Wilmington doesn't necessarily mean that you should. You have to have that knowledge of the market. You have to have direct access to the information. you got to have the tools. And experience does help. Again, once you get out and do this a few times, it'll get better. For a fee, as we mentioned earlier, you're identifying the assignment. I'm finding um, probable sales price for a property for this attorney. So he can issue the divorce decree, right? Identify your assignment. What is it you're doing it? Who are you doing it for and why? And you're just studying the market. Study your subject property. Note all the features. What's going on in your market?
again, our version of the sales comparison approach is the CMA. If we know sales price and rental values, we may be able to use the gross rent multiplier. If we know rental rates, operating income, we may be able to use the income capitalization approach. No matter what, we're always going to report as a range. So I'm not going to give an actual number. That's where I come in and, you know, Mr. Seller, based on my CMA, I think your probable sales price is going to be between 190 and 194.5. Let's list it at 198 or whatever in this market. But I just say our probable range was 190 to 194.5. So let's list it at 240. And, uh, <laughs> All markets have a different response to that, don't they? I think absolutely. And I think the sellers that are getting taught value today are the ones that are listing it, pricing it right. Let the buyers drive the price up. The sellers aren't. I think those are the sellers that are getting more than what they ever thought. Personal opinion, I leave you with that. But that's been my experience. If you're pricing it right, the buyers will drive it up. And that's where we see sales price to close price ratios of more than 100%. And that's what we're seeing a lot right now. They're closing for more than what they were listed for. We're good for today. So you guys got your homework assignments. Again, send them to me this week. Please email them to me or text me so I can give you credit. We'll go over them pretty quickly next week. Um, when we come together on Saturday, we're gonna finish working with sellers. Then we're gonna work with buyers and then we're gonna work in dual agency, a little bit in property management. So you guys have a good week. Those of you that are active, why don't you go sell a house so you can come back on Saturday and tell us about it. Fair enough. That's all you gotta do this week. Do your homework and sell a house, that's it. Um, in the meantime, don't forget about the little practice quizzes and stuff and learn test pass because a lot's going to happen between now and nine o'clock next Saturday morning. So I don't want you to forget what we've covered this weekend. I want you to be prepared for your exam next week. If you have any questions, I'm around. Please don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. That's why I'm here. Fair enough. All right. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you next Saturday morning. We're halfway there.